He was a symbol of courage and resilience. And now he's the latest publicly known casualty of this pandemic, Captain Tom Moore, a World War II veteran who collected millions of pounds to support the British health sector in its fight against COVID-19. Now Sir Tom has succumbed to the virus himself and Britons are bidding him farewell. But most COVID-19 deaths happen in obscurity, far away from the public eye and often without a proper send-off. More than 2.2 million people have died from the coronavirus worldwide so far. Some countries even have to create new space for the graves. Many cemeteries are like assembly lines of wakes and funerals. The pandemic has made one of the most traumatic experiences in a person's life even harder to cope with. Welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones and I have to say those images are hard to bear. But that's the reality millions are living with since the start of this pandemic. The death toll is overwhelming, also for those whose job it is to give the deceased a dignified send-off. There should be a moment of prayer, but there's no time for that. There are simply too many coffins, too many bodies arriving at the Döbeln crematorium in Saxony. Some days there are more bodies than we can actually cremate on a single day. This is strenuous for our employees, also because there's no end in sight. We are standing in the morning hall of our crematorium. It usually accommodates 90 people for the funeral services. Unfortunately, we had to convert the hall into a storage space because we could no longer keep up with the deaths. It's a difficult situation for us because relatives can usually say goodbye to their loved ones here. But at the moment, that's not possible. No room for a funeral service. Not all of the coffins represent deaths from the coronavirus, but many of them are marked so. These people had to end their lives without a final hug from their loved ones. Lutz Berisch cares for the bereaved. He is a pastor in Döbeln. Families sometimes only realize how dangerous the coronavirus can be once they've lost a loved one to it. I have contact with families who have lost a relative because of COVID-19. They're in a state of shock and reconsidering things. This first phase of mourning, the so-called shock phase, lasts longer for them because something inexplicable, something incomprehensible has been added, namely this pandemic. The pandemic is far from over. Many more cremations will be carried out here. Gerald Münster is worried about the future. Assuming that the number of infections remains high, it follows that the number of deaths will too. And that means we won't see any relief here until mid-February at the earliest. It is a winter of mourning in Döbeln as it is in many places in the world during the pandemic. Thorsten Benkel is a thanatologist at the University of Passau, which means that he engages in the academic study of death and dying. And he joins us now. Good to have you with us. Uh, now, people die all the time. We all know that. But is losing a loved one now during this pandemic harder than normally? Or is that just our perception? Well, I think it's hard all the time. It doesn't really matter what the circumstances are. If you lose a loved one, you, you deal with different things than just the cause of death. I mean, of course, it's tragic to have a pandemic and so many people die. It's the sheer mass that 
uh, really makes us feel uncomfortable when reading the news. But for the families, for the bereaved ones, I don't think it really matters so much. But, uh, I mean, the difficult part of mourning, and I, I know that from personal experience, is the part of letting go, and that is usually helped by rituals and ceremonies that can't take place now. How can we compensate for that to help us get closure? Well, that's true. The, the problem is that the pandemic uh, has some effects on all those rituals. You can still have rituals, of course, but you cannot have the traditional way of letting go in uh, in a burial, for instance, and you cannot talk to the funeral directors in a way that uh, you could do before a corona struck us. Um, people nowadays tend to individualize their mourning more than they did uh, decades ago. So for some, not much changes because they say, if I lose a loved one, I will treat this problem in my very personal and own way. So I don't need those collective rituals. That's the one perspective. But the other perspective is people say, I need the usual, the traditional surrounding. I need the traditional rituals. I need a, you know, I need a way to let go that is, uh, that has traditional bonds with everything that I've learned from my childhood on and how we treat the dead. And those people are really desperate because they cannot have what they are used to or what they expect from lo uh, um, letting go and losing someone they mm. love. Mm. Um, I, talked, I talked to some people who said, I wanted to go to the funeral um, director and uh, all I got was an email link and I should do everything online and type in what my, my wishes are and no one was uh, willing to talk to me in person and I just have to pay then and uh, just we do it on a written basis and for them it was really terrible. Right. I mean, and they uh, need something. Death, death is an extremely personal experience, as personal as it can get. Uh, if we turn sides, let's talk about those on the other side. I mean, how important is it for a dying person to have family uh, or friends around? Because this is something that a lot of those who are left behind really grapple with. Yeah, that's true. Most people that die, and uh, consciously know I am dying, for instance, in a hospice or maybe of cancer or something like that, um, most people want their loved ones with them, their family, their friends, their partners, their children. That's the usual way. Very small minority say, no, I don't want them with me because I don't want to you know, give them an impression of a, uh, of a loved person dying and having these, these pictures in their minds forever. But this is a minority. Most people feel more comfortable and due to the pandemic. This is not or not as much possible as it used to be. In the first round in, uh, in the spring of 2020, um, they had a lockdown even on those hospices. Um, people were not allowed or only one person was allowed to attend or to visit someone. This has now changed in um, many parts of Germany at least. But still, it's far from being perfect because, you know, if you want to see someone who's about to die, you don't really, it's not the first thing on your mind is the hygienic elements of it or the rules that come with it. Uh, you just want to be with this person. This is an emotional matter and emotional matters are not really, cannot be compensated by rational measures. How important is a ceremony, not just for us as individuals, but uh, for society as a whole? Well, you know, society needs rituals and ceremonies because they are a symbolic frame, so to speak, for living together. You know, for instance, a burial, it doesn't really care, it doesn't really matter what the deceased person thinks about it because that person is dead. Um, it's done for purposes of showing solidarity to all the other people that still live. The, the, the people that, the relatives and the neighbors, they show and present themselves to attend the funeral so that we all know we stand together, we are united, even if we are usually not. That's the main and the core idea of a burial ritual. Nowadays, right. in individualized society, it's become a bit different though. Of course, but it's 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 also, I mean, now this pandemic, that's why it's called a pandemic, uh, there are more than two million dead around the globe and we've hardly had national memorials so far. Uh, only recently, US President Joe Biden, uh, 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 one year into the pandemic, actually held a memorial for more than 400,000 Americans who died of COVID-19. Other countries, including Germany, uh, haven't done any of that yet. Why not? Isn't that important? 
Well, um, actually, it's not the usual way um, how this is uh, how a pandemic is uh, treated. Usually, uh, national memorials are done at least uh, the pers German perspective is if famous people die, everyone knows, and if they have a really big. Um, you know, big uh, famous politicians have imp had impact on the country. Uh, and pandemic has nameless victims. It's hard to say, but really it's the average people that die, not famous people. And it's unusual. Sometimes you have the churches who do something like that. Uh, they will do that once it's over, I guess. We will uh, then reflect on what has happened. And there will be some rituals, some symbolic gestures. But it is not something that society really demands. It's mm -hmm. purely symbolic. It doesn't help the relatives who lost someone. I mean, it's a harsh perspective maybe that I'm taking as a scientist, but really it doesn't help much. And people realize more and more, once more and more in an individualized society that we don't need those collective rituals. Rather, people prefer personal, individual rituals that really put the person lost in the spectrum, in the, in the center and not everyone who died because those uh, hundred thousands or millions who died you know pers i don't know any of those and even if i know three or four or five the others are not important for my life you can't relate it's hard to, to say mm -hmm. but that is no you, no one can re really relate to them we all read the news and say it's terrible so many people died but for us it's a number for most people it's just a number we don't really get the scope anyway if you hear two million dead you can't even imagine what two million people are. If you see them at one place from, from a helicopter, two million people, and you realize they are all dead, that would be terrible, but we don't have that perspective. Exactly. You just say you know? that uh, we, we read about it every day and we say it's terrible. It's quite interesting, actually, and uh, I've heard it from other people as well. And it happens to me that I've been reading those uh, daily death statistics now for weeks and weeks, and it starts to no longer really bother me. Is that worrying or is that normal? Yeah, that's absolutely normal. That's exactly what happens. Uh, in the first weeks or months, people are really terrified. Oh, I can't get this disease and I could die and my loved ones could die. But we get in a, in a very, uh, well, uncomfortable way, we get used to it. We don't like the idea of having a pandemic. We want, don't want to die, but it's the same every day. You read those statistics every day, and once it's more, once it's less corpses, but we get used to it. People always get used to any conditions they live in, and this is what happening. what's happening with COVID right now. Now, this is, of course, not the very first time that humanity faces so many deaths in such a short period of time. We've had world wars, we had the Spanish flu, we had uh, various plagues. Are there any learnings? What do we know about those crises and, and how those affected people and the way they were dealing with death? Well, in the past, uh, the good thing about those plagues was that they were very, uh, they, they, were, they didn't take place in a globalized world. You know, you had specific regions mostly, sometimes quite big regions like uh, was the whole of Europe was affected, but nothing else then. And so in a way you could always cope with them because once the dead people were dead and the others were trying to escape, um, the pandemic or the plagues that we had, they just ceased to exist. They don't really cease to exist, but they become, you know, you can control them and they're very small outbreaks of them. Now we have a pandemic that is globalized because you can go by plane from every place in the world to every other place in a short time. So that makes things difficult. But the good thing is, Humanity has always been able to overcome every plague or every uh, deadly uh, sickness that was around. And we will be able to overcome uh, COVID as well. I'm absolutely sure about that. Problem is, it will take more time and different measures because people today are much more connected to each other and they're not used to staying just in one region and especially they're not used to die. Because we, ha we live in the Western world, we live in a society where everyone says be getting old is the usual uh, case and dying young is not the usual case. When we had uh, in the Middle Ages, you had the plague, well, people didn't so bother so much because they died anyways with 40 <laughs> or so. So dying with 30 wasn't s such a big topic. Yeah, that was a yeah, time yeah, when yeah. death was called the tamed it death because everybody knew about dying. It was an average uh, occurrence. Today, death is something we don't even want to think about. Exactly. We don't think about it much. We, we certainly don't like to talk about it. Everything is about 
youth and eternal life. Uh, but you, and this is uh, the final question, but I have to ask it, you decided uh, to dedicate your studies to, well, a grim topic uh, from uh, today's uh, views. Why would someone choose to study death? Well, the, the answer is quite boring. It's just because it's interesting, you know. I don't have a very personal uh, story about death, and I'm not really traumatic experiences that I want to compensate with my scientific uh, doings. No, actually, it is interesting. It's interesting to see uh, how people deal with it because everyone sooner or later is affected. It's interesting to compare cultural dealings with death, and not many people in my field of sociology do it. So. It all speaks for um, going for it, and that's what I'm doing for 10 years now. Well, and that was very good for us because we could talk to you about it. Uh, Torsten Benker, sociologist and thanatologist, uh, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Now, of course, to prevent as many COVID-19 deaths as possible, we turn to vaccines. But the virus is not making it easy. Time for your questions now. And over to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Wouldn't modifying vaccines due to new variants be a huge undertaking? Modifying vaccines would be a lot easier and faster in some ways than you might think, but it would still be a pretty big deal. Um, most of the vaccines approved so far work by getting your cells to create viral proteins. So basically, the shot you're getting contains genetic blueprints, for example, in the form of messenger RNA, which instructs your cells to make the spike protein that dots the outside of SARS-CoV-2. Um, those proteins provoke your immune system to recognize the virus without ever being exposed to it. Um, when the spike protein changes due to mutation, making a new variant more transmissible, for instance, then in theory, we can quickly figure out what's causing the changes at the genetic level and just update the blueprint in our vaccines to tell the body to start making a variant spikes in addition to the original ones. So it's not all that complicated theoretically, but, but the reality of changing vaccine production processes, even a little, uh, would pose some pretty major challenges, I think, and, and makers are facing enough of those at the moment already. Uh, then there's the question of the kind of trials that updated vaccines would have to go through to be considered safe and effective. Uh, would manufacturers have to start from square one again? No, probably not. But, but altered vaccines would certainly have to go through some testing. So, so, so changes would take months to implement. Um, fortunately, we have some experience with this overall situation. Uh, flu vaccines have to be updated regularly to remain effective. So at least there's a framework in place to, to help guide healthcare authorities. Back to Captain Tom Moore. He may be gone, but his legacy lives on. The super fundraiser has inspired 11-year-old footballer Imogen Papworth Heidel. She is using her skill at kippy uppies, the tricky art of keeping the ball in the air without letting it touch the ground, to raise thousands of pounds for key workers. And she's also inspired others to use their soccer skills for a good cause. Now, shortly before he died, Captain Tom said Imogen's efforts were cool. And we want to leave you with that thought.